My son's in one woman that watches this channel. In life, you are presented two choices. You can choose to look at a lake and have a healthy amount of respect because you are human and barely able to swim anyhow, and you really cannot see what's in the water, or you could be the guy and girl that get eaten at the beginning of Jaws. Which way, Western man? If you chose the latter over the former, honestly, in humanity's evolutionary past, you were definitely the person the tribe would send into the waters first to see if there were any predators in there. Which I'm glad you're watching this. Your job was always really important, uh, and <laughs> thank you for your sacrifice. But what luck? It also ties in perfectly with the discussion today. In the events of Lake Placid, everything seemingly is going swimmingly for a small main community located 25 miles away from Blake Lake. Seeing as there are only about two people that really live near this isolated lake, it has been generally left alone to exist in its pristine, untouched state. However, as we all know, we as a species need to touch every area of this planet because this is our rock. Sorry, other species. Uh, looks like you didn't develop your frontal lobes in time. Hope you like being a house cat. As the wildlife people head out there to look at a beaver dam, one of them would stumble across something which is my literal ingrained in my genetics nightmare fuel. Something about this entire movie, down to my core, is just horrifying. Enough about my own fears, though. A species of animal lurks within the waters below, ready to swallow anything that gets close enough. But the question is, what is it? How did it get here? And how does this line up with reality concerning size and geographical location? Let's discuss that over today's episode covering Lake Placid. We open up our story scanning over a lake. Lakes, as mentioned, freak me out. It's the murky water. Completely off topic, which... <laughs> gonna be a lot of this in this video. Uh, I went to a lake in Canada known as Lake Cushagawigamog, which is a real name, and I learned what a murky was. Basically, it's a freshwater barracuda that the owner of the shop had caught, and it was like six foot long, and he had one on the wall. Yeah, I didn't go back in the water after that. Anyhow, panning over the lake, it's pristine. We are in Maine, but moving into the water, it's horrific. But as we come up, there's a scuba diver and a cop on a boat. The scuba Steve guy works for the fish in game, and that's the bane of every hunter or fisherman's existence. Falling backwards out of this boat, there's a reason for that actually. If he didn't fall backwards and fell forward instead, he would have just rolled back into the boat. The cop then sits up top waiting for him as this absolute mad lad heads in looking for something in the murky depths. Approaching what appears to be a large beaver dam, he then heads towards a particular large hole coming out the front, which is usually how beavers get out of their dams. Feeling around, something then starts creeping up on him. As he turns around, it's lake water so he can't see much, but he starts to feel uneasy because he's in lake water. A beaver then comes out at like Mach 5, scaring him as the cop eats a Twinkie. Health. As he looks around, really nothing can be seen on the surface, but as Fish and Game Boy over here enters the beaver dam, it's a nice place. Seeing something move though, something else is approaching him. Biting down on him, he gets pulled back, and now's a great time to tell you, this movie attack has left my view of water scarred and deformed, but I can assure you, I still do get into lakes from time to time. Uh, that's because I'm not a total puss. Attempting to surface Officer Observant over here, which took me five times recording that to get it correct, uh, completely misses him, and then he starts getting dragged across the surface. Obviously, this is quite alarming to uh, Officer Doofy as FNG gets dragged under and then eaten, but only his tank comes back up to the surface. JK, though, because there's a jump scare. He tries to get in the boat as the officer brings up half his body, and at least the important half, uh, and he's pretty much done then and there. So now just for fun, how long could you actually survive this? Well, the unfortunate part about being bitten in half is that uh, when your spinal cord is severed, this will typically send you into shock almost immediately, rendering you unable to do much of anything. Think of it like a taser to the brain, essentially. Your body would go into complete panic mode, but you may be able to overcome it for a few moments if enough adrenaline is pumping into your system. But the real issue here is the guy would have to deal with his entire abdominal aorta being severed. It's accepted that a complete terror of this area, along with uh, the fact that the heart would be beating at at least 180 beats per minute, probably, with barely any blood returning to the heart due to the fact that the inferior vena cava is also severed by the event, you would have probably about 30 seconds, if you're lucky. Honestly, it's amazing the dude was even able to get back into the boat. So my advice to you, don't get bisected. It's horrible for your body's blood economy. Meanwhile, over in an equally more bloodthirsty place, New York, we meet Kelly. She's working on them dinosaur bones because every movie in this era was influenced by Jurassic Park. As Kevin calls down to her, he needs to talk to her because he's sleazy and his name is Kevin. Just a step away from Keith, if you ask me. She is meditating in a room by herself afterwards because she got some news. Kevin, the nerd who called her from upstairs, has just dumped her. Why do I all of a sudden dislike Kevin's? I don't. I think it has more to do with just the average New Yorker mentality. The woman that walks in apparently has been hooking up with Kelly's boyfriend, which is Kevin. Like, what a turd in the punch bowl. I get this, her excuse is, the heart wants what the heart wants. Okay, well, the heart of Kelly should want to punch you in the face for saying that. I mean, the heart wants what the heart wants, right? Anyways, back over in Maine, we finally meet Mr. President before the aliens invade. He is there to check on the FNG guy. Alarmed by this, they don't really know what could have caused this. 
Jaws, probably. I mean, everybody had that irrational fear when they were younger of, like, you know, Jaws being in the pool with you. Jumping over to New York once again, Kevin comes to talk with Kelly again. Kevin is sending Kelly to Maine to examine the fragment of the tooth. It is apparently prehistoric in nature. Sending your ex-girlfriend away on business, huh? Man, what an absolute Chad. She declines the offer, but it is her boss, so she sent out to Maine anyhow. But don't worry, Mr. President will be there to greet you. This is also why you don't fraternize with your superiors. Yes, power is sexy, uh, but it's not worth it in the end. Flying with novice Eric guy over here, which is also my nightmare, they finally get to the hospital as they take Kelly to the autopsy room to examine the guy and then find the tooth that was lodged in him. Deducing that it must be reptilian, it also isn't a fossil. Uncovering the FNG guy, she asks about the attack. It went on for only a few seconds, so she's pretty much like completely convinced now she needs to go to the lake. Nobody apparently lives near the lake except an old couple, but that's about it. So depleting what's left of the ozone layer, Kelly then sprays aerosol to get rid of some bugs near her, as then she spots the president. A marriageable man all the way out here? What are the odds? They're both sarcastic too. Wow. wow. So there's an exchange that goes over about as well as barebacking a $5 hooker, which uh, typically is how all my interactions with any girlfriend I've ever had went at first. It's how I think I identify potential. So he calls her ma'am a few times, so she threatens to sue him over that. I mean, I would definitely get sued. I'm from the South. That's like an impossible challenge for me. So uh, Burnett comes out and asks something. I don't know. I wasn't listening. And then the cop shoots his shot 2024, but it's a big swing and a miss. Don't worry, fella. Same. Many of the women that I've talked to in Huntsville lose immediate interest when I tell them I do YouTube for a living. Even more so when I tell them what it's actually about. My god, it is a classic out here. So, heading out to the lake in a small crappy boat, when something is literally biting people in half, they stop over at a couple's house. Except, it's a single as, like, as her. It's just her. And this is Betty White, god bless. So her husband apparently backed out of his moral contract, which we all do eventually, as Betty White literally admits to having taken out her husband. Bruh. And then again, hopefully my future wife does the same for me. He insisted, apparently, that he wanted to be taken out, so she ended him and then hit him in the head with a skillet and then buried him on the property. Like, she admits to this, and nobody investigates it, like, at all. They just sort of leave. Like, okay, guys, uh, bang up job on the police work. So Kelly now realizes that they have to camp out there in tents. No toilets, no beds, and according to the sheriff, they forgot to pack feminine napkins, whatever those are. So they continue to make fun of her from being, you know, from New York, which is totally appropriate. Which, uh, I'm going to Boston here, like, tomorrow. I'm sure I will be made fun of. So as they stop, they find a moose head. And in fact, did you know, the only natural predator to a moose is an orca whale. They will dive down to eat kelp, and then orcas will literally hunt them. Stay tuned for more real facts that sound incredibly fake. So she slaps the sheriff because he just threw a moose's head at her, and a fight ensues as, like, she just straight assaults an officer. This is a bit alarming to them as they get some more deputies out there because they're going to need a bigger boat. So they show Kelly to her tent as then, you know, she's going to get her own and it's actually not that bad. The other cop tries to nope out of there as Kelly asks if men go all deliverance in the wilderness. And not really. Usually what we do is just make like a bunch of firewood and burn stuff, drink some beer, and occasionally go ape mode running through the forest in full tactical gear if it's a full moon. That's pretty much about it. So Mr. President starts making his move on Kelly through sarcastic flirting as a helicopter now arrives. And oh no, it's Hector Sear. Does that name mean anything to you? Well, it should. He's here to investigate the crocodile situation. They ask how a crocodile could be in Maine, which is a pretty appropriate question, I guess. But back in my hometown, we actually had an alligator someone released. His name was Fairfield Frank. Dude was huge. Someone released it like way back, like 10, 15 years ago. I'm not even really sure if we've caught it yet. So it does happen. But in this instance, I believe it is really just a totally different event based on like context clues that we hear throughout the movie. And Hector says he's there to help them find it. Why would anyone want to swim with crocodiles? That's just beyond me. So they set out in tiny canoes, like really small crafts, with something that they assume to be a giant crocodile literally biting off the bodies of moose. Very good. As they scan, they eventually stop as Hector's like, oh, I heard something. So they discuss how a crocodile could even survive up here. As long as the nostrils don't freeze, they can breathe air and survive and not drown. And that's usually about, I believe, if the water reaches 45 degrees, they will actually go unconscious. So this is just to stop them from, you know, sinking and drowning. So this is something that is rather important that was said, which we will kind of tie into the timeline of events that may have taken place. Looking forward, a bunch of white perch then start freaking out as they are scared. The canoe is then immediately yeeted into the air. See, you needed a bigger boat than that. So Hector tells them that they need to keep their legs still as they climb back into the canoe and they don't listen to this at all. Nobody actually saw anything as the crocodile never attacked, which was great for the plot. Kelly reports back that the mission status is completely not sick. 
So as they regroup, another officer tells the sheriff to come over as they find a human toe. So why not ask the old lady who literally admitted to murder just a few minutes ago about the human toe near a lake? I'm just saying. They now know due to like worms and bite patterns apparently that they have a crocodile just from one toe. Yes, seems about right. Now, where did I put that herpetology degree? That night, everyone is dancing in a tent going all deliverance while two officers dig a hole. It's just what you do. They are setting up a trap, as they were paid $500 by Hector, and hey, you know what, I'd take it too. As we move into the tent, wow, those are some amazing dance moves. The sheriff then breaks into the party and then says, hey, we're here on official business, so everybody go to your tents. Hector explains that the hole is out there because crocodiles like to come up on land and are attracted to noise. The sheriff thinks that, well, Hector's pretty much mental. That night, with the party complete, Kelly goes to hit on the president again. She remarks how flat the water is. It's almost placid, if you will. Tin skips, easy with a flat stone. Kelly is then told to stay on shore, but she doesn't want to. He says, paleontologists are not just sent to Maine to hunt for crocodiles, technically correct. So she tells him, yeah, my ex-boyfriend sent me here to hunt for giant crocodiles in Maine. I don't really want to go back. Looking for that rebound action is a classic blunder. It, you know, actually, I'm, I, I don't know, maybe it's not. Just depends on really what your long-term goals are. So he tells her, all right, 7 a.m., you're allowed to join in on the crocodile hunt. Hopefully another head doesn't get thrown at her. So as they settle in for the night, they hear a banjo. All right, I made that part up. The sheriff then gets out of his tent to go take a leak, and as he does, he hears rustling, which is never a good sign. He then hears a twig break. Looking into the dense underbrush, he pulls out man's answer to everything. It was man who was made in God's image, That's not no, you, creature. No, no. Pulling back a limb, it was just Hector in a spring trap, or setting a spring trap. So everyone then wakes up to investigate, and then they threaten Hector for laying traps that could literally save them, saying that, oh, if you interfere, you're out. Like, he's the crocodile guy. Maybe you listen to him at least, like, a little, I guess. But then Hector ruins all credibility by saying crocodiles are divine conduits. Yeah, mission abort. <laughs> I'm listening to him. Uh... No. So the sheriff then falls into a trap that was dug earlier, probably, you know, totally take himself out. Nice. So the next morning, bright and early, they then head out on a small boat again to look around and scuba. There were guys who are literally bitten in half and they want to get back into the water. So they get some, like, crocodile baby hatchling sounds ready so that the crocodile will come to them. Hector says they don't attack under the water, you know, except for that guy who's bitten in half at the start, but this just seems like a really stupid idea, guys. So Kelly wishes the president luck as then they both fall backward. The reason you don't fall forward is because if you fall forward, Hector then insults the sheriff before going in. They lower the speaker to produce the hatchling sounds and take their positions. While down there, they find the moose has been completely gutted. Kelly continues talking to the sheriff about how Hector isn't mental. He's just, well, he's just sure it's a crocodile. Like really sure. He's seen every crocodile in the world. Maybe even a couple twice. Sometimes he even calls them at home. Swimming in the same area, the president is the first to spot a giant tail moving by, and that would be where I walk on water because my soul would leave my body. As they then wait at the top, the sheriff has already called it, but the line then gets pulled, which then starts pulling the boat, knocking Kelly backwards into the water. The reason Kelly... <laughs> so time to start swimming towards land, gal. They then cut the anchor line as, let's like, let go of the anchor, and then while they're trying to get the motor started, White Perch gets scared as it starts going towards Kelly. They get going and then punch it right as it's right under her. She gets on the boat and is pulled up before it can get to her, but just kidding, it was the president. He gets in next as Kelly asks where Hector is. As he starts his ascent, they then spot Bubbles in the distance. They head over to grab him as one of the officers pulls up the speaker, and as he does, good lord, the crocodile bites off his head in one clean chunk. Ouchies. Oh, you probably wouldn't feel that. Although, you, because it was so... Okay, how exactly did this happen? I mean, I guess maybe it chomped down on his head? But, like, the way the mouth was open, that was, like, more of a guillot- Did you- did you hear that voice crack? Good lord. That was, like, more of a guillotine action than just- I don't know. I don't think it would happen that way. But then again, you know, I'm just kind of a, a biologist, so who knows? Getting back to land, they load him up as the Stadies come to hang out, and the president fills out a report. He asks if Kelly's okay, but, uh, probably not. Might need some therapy for that one. The U.S. Wildlife is then heading in, and they just want everyone to sit tight for the time being. I mean, Kelly- you didn't really know Officer Burke, but just kidding, that is completely traumatizing. Hector then goes to apologize to the sheriff as he wishes he knew Officer Burke better. Hector then tells him about a recurring nightmare where, yeah, he's also been headless. And then, I'm just gonna go ahead and say, uh, Hector is probably like two sandwiches short of a picnic. The sheriff then immediately gets got in another trap, which made me laugh, because you can't be too sad for too long in movies in the 90s. So, Kelly then asks the sheriff if, uh, it's okay to pull him down, and it was really just a counterweight. The sheriff then runs after Hector with a big stick. So as they approach the water's edge, like a big old bear comes charging out of nowhere. And as he does, it seems a little bizarre for a bear, but it's almost immediately grabbed by the crocodile and dragged to its fate. For some reason, 
This is now like, oh, it must be a crocodile. You guys saw Officer Burke get his head bit off by a crocodile. Why is it now all of a sudden, oh, I guess it is a crocodile. Also, bears do not typically like humans or human noises. Why would it, why would it do that? Anyways, it doesn't matter because it's now has convinced the sheriff as he finally agrees it's a crocodile. It's an Asian crocodile, Indo-Pacific to be exact. They think this thing is around 30 feet long. Hector says it's a miracle of nature, they just can't blow it away. Well, you can actually, but Hector then gets punched despite him knowing karate and being a brown belt. All right, so now that we have actually seen this thing, to understand what it is doing here and why it is such a large animal, you need to know about specifically Indo-Pacific crocodiles or saltwater crocs. This specific type of crocodile, they're about roughly 23 feet in length and can weigh up to 2,205 pounds. These are essentially dinosaurs of the modern day. And I know someone's going to freak out and tell me, actually, they're not dinosaurs, Roanoke. It's inevitable. It's just a comparison, you nerd. Anyhow, these exist on the planet right now and are second only to the anglerfish in terms of I'd rather these things really not be here with me on this planet, but I can't do anything about it. While 23 feet in length appears to be what has been recorded on the maximum size range, this does hint that something else may have happened concerning this crocodile in Lake Placid. Indo-Pacific crocodiles specifically exist around Southeast Asia and are native to this area, which means F's in the chat for my editor. Godspeed, King. Fly high. But their range is typically going to be from India all the way to the northern edge of Australia and everything in between. They will actually venture out into open ocean quite regularly using the ocean currents in order to travel. In fact, there was one individual in freedom units who traveled about 255 miles in 20 days. Or if you want to use, uh, I don't know, what is the rest of the planet using? Some sort of outdated nonsense. 411 kilometers. They don't really move much in order to conserve energy. They'll just use the currents to carry them along. They are a fairly lethargic species, so they would just kind of float as they go, and being that they're absolutely massive creatures, they don't really have to worry about much. But somewhere, at some point in time, I guarantee it happened, an epic battle very likely took place between a giant saltwater crocodile and a great white shark. It has to have happened at some point on this planet's existence. So regardless of that, strange though, this does not seem to be enough. If we look at the planet currently with its configuration, for a saltwater crocodile to get from the Indo-Pacific region, there are literally only like two ways to do it. And it cannot go so far north that it's going to adventure into like Arctic waters because it will freeze due to those temperatures. It could also maybe go like far to the south, around South America, but that is a ton of open ocean spanning thousands of miles because it's the Pacific Ocean, so that's going to be a very difficult process. And the other route, it would just literally take it around Africa and then it would have to shoot north towards North America. Both? Well, I guess really all three. I'm not really considering the Arctic route to be feasible, so either it has to go around South America, unless it went to the freaking uh, Panama Canal, which, I mean, I don't know. That's not happening. Or it would have to go around Africa. Those are really the only two options that it has. But these routes would be almost virtually impossible for this species to take, as it would make no sense for it to actually make it this far without running across any other suitable area. Not to mention an inland lake in Maine how would it choose this location or even just happen upon it? All I'm saying is, given the size of this creature and the location that it was in and how it got there, it makes it very unlikely it just happened to decide to travel one day to this specific area. Not to mention what we will see later sort of gets rid of this idea rather quickly. Something else had to happen, and for this we need to take a trip back, like way back to a time when the surface of the planet looked completely different, but we'll get there momentarily. So they separate for the evening as Mr. President is like, wounded somehow as Kelly can fix his wounds. She then patches him up as they talk about the bear's face when he got grabbed by a crocodile. My face would probably look about the same. So Mr. President does the smolder to her as it actually starts working. Like, you know what the smolder is. I've used it on uh, some women before too. Surprisingly, it does work. So she starts talking about how this is exciting. So she says, oh, well, we should go to bed. Yes. Well, she kind of messes that one up, but they're ready to trauma bond. The best three weeks of your life. After that, results may vary. So the first fight is going to be a doozy. Just be prepared for that. Later on, as they then watch videos on giant crocodiles, I suppose this is Hector's personal stash, he talks with the sheriff about how crocodiles only have one natural enemy. Man, that's absolutely right. Hector then gets asked why the crocodile is even here. And he doesn't really know. I mean, really? You don't think maybe someone could have just brought it over? Absolutely not. So, let's discuss. As we will find out, spoiler, the crocodile is estimated to be roughly about 150 years old. This movie came out in 1999, so this would put it at probably an event that happened in 1849. 
While not completely infeasible for someone to have just brought it over, it was suggested that nobody has really lived on this lake ever, and while the US got its start on the east coast, one of the things about Maine is it's still relatively untouched. In fact, it's pretty much stated that this particular area, again, nobody has lived or is living out there except for the old couple that is single now. So, how did this crocodile get there, and based on what we will see later, what evidence is there to support this? To speculate wildly, because that's why I'm here, we need to go back, <laughs> bear with me, Roughly about 95 million years ago when the surface of the Earth looked completely different. Looking at a map due to continental drift, it was around this time that the North American continent and the Eurasia continent were beginning to drift apart. This opened up a shallow sea in between the two previously joined continents, with many islands and larger land masses in between those two continents. As this drift would continue, eventually the waters would recede and more stable land would remain, and that's going to be Europe, with Asia being way over in the east and North America being far to the west. But what's important to remember is how the continents were structured and the area of Maine itself would have been inundated with a shallow sea. So, you can see where I'm going. <laughs> You're a pretty smart person. Well, while this global restructuring was going on, which is still happening to this day because it's never really stopped, there existed a specific species of crocodile that is related now to the Indo-Pacific saltwater crocodile. This species, known as Sarcosuchus, which pretty sure I pronounced that correctly, is a distant relative of living crocodiles today, and it was estimated that they could reach up to 29.5 to 31.2 feet and weigh almost roughly four tons. That's around nine to 9.5 meters. Their heads were massive, with lower jaws being a little longer than their upper jaw. And if we look at the crocodile head in Lake Placid, we can see it's not massively noticeable concerning the jaw differences, but the lower jaw itself is a little longer. But the point is, we have a species that existed roughly 95 million years ago when North America was separated by a few islands from Asia. The waters were warmer, and here we have this species that was typically relegated to like a desert from what we can tell, but with many similar patterns of entering water, or at least they were just beginning to exhibit these patterns. What I believe happened is, this may have been kind of like a migratory event that went wrong. At some point, an ancient crocodile made the swim island by island, and now probably just wasn't like a single crocodile, but over successive generations, the habitat would be pushed west from Eurasia. And this is supported in a moment, so actually hang in there. So day two of camping, Kelly is having a freak out about ticks, least of your concern. As they find a giant footprint, like Bro C, Jurassic Park affected every single movie in the 90s. Finding the cove the crocodile lives in, this seems like a very bad idea. Kelly and Independence Day man now try to lift the print as Kelly gets hit with like another random human head. You know, as one does in the wilderness. Like, who is that? I can't tell. Like, I, I don't, I don't know. So, probably somebody random. So Kelly decides uh, she doesn't want to be here any longer because she's tired of being hit by heads. But as they look out, they spot the murderer from earlier bringing a cow out. You know, where a head just happens to be nearby. And also, she's bringing a cow out. Again, like, I just said that, but it can't be good. Oh, and there's the crocodile. It's feeding time, baby. Leaving the cow, she drops it off and smacks the cow's butt as the crocodile grabs it and consumes the whole thing. That explains why it's so large, or at least how it's been subsisting all this time. So they go and confront her and she says, well, I haven't broken any laws. Bro, you admitted to a murder earlier. I think you have. She says she lied because otherwise they would take the crocodile out. She's been feeding it for six years at this point. She said that at first they threw it some scraps, but she has no idea how it got here. The sheriff asks if the crocodile took out her husband. She then says that a horse got loose and the crocodile started coming in and her husband went to intercede and got eaten. Okay, grandma is sundowning at this point, so she says it's the crocodile's lake. Over at the helicopter, Hector then lands the rig on Crocodile Cove. Hot Cop says she doesn't like this, so she says, hey, I will bang you if we just get out of here. Tough choice. Hmm. Gonna have to go with your purpose on this one. It's more attractive anyways. So he rolls backwards off the helicopter because if you roll- Burnett cop calls in to tell him Hector went swimming as she goes to the edge of the helicopter. No, haha, <laughs> don't feed yourself to the crocodile, you're so pretty. While Hector is down there, he sees nothing. Resurfacing and looking around, no thanks. Continuing to see a whole bunch of nothing, he hears a snarl. Turning around, yeah man, he's telling that thing, you're not gonna hurt me, but it might hurt you. As it looks at him, he says he feels foolish. No kidding! It's apparently different from the others, so Burnett Cop turns on the helicopter as he slowly swims backwards. Hector continues talking to it, as he's not trying to show any fear, but he definitely crapped his pants in the water. Hector then takes off his inflation kit as he goes for it, as he jumps into the helicopter and takes off, but as they do, it grabs the helicopter. Yeesh. Burnett Cop takes a few shots at it as they're able to pull up and get out of there before getting totally got. 
Returning back to shore, he's officially grounded because he put a deputy at risk. Hector says that they have no authority over him. I'm pretty sure the cops do. So Kelly then goes to check on him as she asks if he's trying to be taken out by that thing. He has a moment about the crocodile and his dignity and whatnot, and then he's like, nah, never mind, I'm not getting back into that water. Smart move. Mr. President then tells them that they need to pack it in as fish and game are going to be there in three hours, as Kelly asks if they're going to try to trap the crocodile. Hector says they're just going to put that thing down, and I mean, arguably, PETA's going to down vote this channel but that is the correct decision Hector says that well we can just sedate it Hector then says that this thing has to be at least 150 years old it migrated from another continent uh, technically correct but probably not this specific one so they discuss an idea of how to trink and net it getting a cow they begin attempting to lure the crocodile onto land taking a boat onto the water <laughs> why God they then use uh, the helicopter I guess to fly the cow over the water and get the crocodile to come up while the sheriff has got the ultra giga elephant round ready to go. And I don't know what sort of round that is, it's basically a noob tube. So as they lower the cow into the water, they get her to swim. They begin setting up the net as Betty White starts saying she hopes the crocodile eats all of them. That night, as they go to call it because the cow doesn't appear to be doing the trick, something appears on screen. It, we know what the something is. The croc is coming. The cow starts swimming again as they start drawing the crocodile in. Locking and loading Brides of Christ, the croc surfaces coming after the cow. As they go after it, they hit the crocodile in the belly, administering at least some of the drugs while Hector straight up drops the cow because he can't fly this thing all of a sudden. Crashing into the water? Nicely done, bro. Totally worth capturing the crocodile, huh? Dropping the tranks, they then go for the force multipliers, and looking out, they can't see Hector. Well, I guess they could've just looked in the cockpit, but whatever. They tell Hector not to move, and he has no idea where the croc is himself. It comes up as then he falls into the water like a total nerd. Climbing back on board though, the sheriff then sits in the water, also like a huge nerd. Like, bro, get out of the water. It comes up at the sheriff chasing him as then they get into a truck, must go faster style. They take a few pot shots as Kelly is once again knocked out of a vehicle, like she has the worst luck. It starts coming after her as they keep taking pot shots at it, but the thing does not care at all. She then gets yeeted into the water like an inch from shore. Get up and run around the thing. But as she sits there, Hector then starts beckoning her over as the crocodile then turns around and heads towards her. The sheriff doesn't have a clean shot though as Hector tells Kelly to go under because apparently it won't attack under the water. Mm. She then swims around the tree and loses it for a moment but then gets stuck in a tree root, naturally. As the croc continues to bite, it gets stuck on the tree which then frees her. Actually like the Spongebob mean, I thought they couldn't attack underwater. They can attack underwater. She then swims up as Hector drags her on board. Coming through the back of the helicopter, the croc gets stuck as they make a break for the shore. And as it tries to go towards the shore, the sheriff says, oh, it's suffering. Hector says, it's trapped, it's passing out. The juice is loose in its system. Well, he didn't say that last part, but I did. Coming onto land, it finally falls asleep, or at minimum starts like chilling out. Like just trank it again. So the sheriff is now presented with a quick time event to destroy or not destroy it. Paragon or Renegade. Mr. President then goes to take it out, but oh, fake out. He just tranks it instead. How many drugs are in that thing? It might actually stop its heart at this point. But oh, fake out. There were two! Hector then gets grabbed, somehow survives, and then they just straight up blow this one up. Oh well, not trapping that one. So finally the feds arrive, which they're always on time, as in like they're always the last of the party on anything. As in they hand the reptile over, and also look at that, the cow survived. They patch his wounds as Hector says he will take the crocodile to Portland. The president and Kelly decide to stay back together, you know, to pack up the campsite, as Kelly says she wants to stay a little longer. And the cops totally, um, well, they CB Mr. President saying, no, we already packed your truck, you're gonna get, like, get out of here. Like, <laughs> that sucks. Ooh, man. Anyways, uh, getting denied is a great feeling, let me tell you that. So he says, well, I guess if I'm ever over in New York, I'll look you up. She then finally like approaches the truck and says, why does nobody make a move in Maine? And he's like, oh, thank God, I couldn't make the move. Yes, uh, women are 100% attracted to insecurity and you totally blowing a moment. I'm just going to, it's false, they aren't. So anyways, they decide to go to the bar. The next morning, I'm sure the old lady gets slapped with like a $3,000 fine as she heads back out to the dock where she's already having her feet back in the water as she starts feeding more of these things. See, this is why you send her to like a facility or something. So they transport the crocodile on the open road as Hector's paying for the whole thing and the government really didn't want to deal with it. So what is the deal here? This species migrated here with multiple members from what we can tell. At first it was just assumed that somehow a single male crocodile got here and was able to swim across the planet, going around multiple continents, drifting in vast open oceans, moving inland from the ocean somehow and ending up in this lake. But personally, I don't buy it. I believe this event happened a long time ago, which has now led to this species essentially getting stuck here. 
a long time ago, due to those shallow seas as mentioned in North America that we also had all over the coast, this left this specific species stranded here over the ensuing years. Crocodiles on average can live between 70 to 100 years due to what appears to be slower metabolisms, with actually an argument out there that they can live way longer like tortoises. They can survive colder temperatures and freezing waters by putting their noses above the waterline so that they do not drown as ice forms around the nose, which also helps keep them upright. Presumably, every winter, this is what would happen with this crocodile as it survives. But then, you may be asking yourself, well, sure, a line of ancient crocodiles could live here, but wouldn't genetic diversity plummet? And the answer is, from a perspective of mammals, yes, but crocodiles are a bit stranger. In Costa Rica, the first known occurrence to humanity has happened. A female crocodile impregnated herself asexually through facultative parthenogenesis and went on to lay about 14 eggs. The eggs laid by the female involved like no contact with males whatsoever. She was in her own structure. The younglings, however, all succumbed, while well, the youngling succumbed at full term and was a genetic replica of the mother. Most of the 14 eggs that were found just contained nothing but a conglomeration of like yolk and cells, like never really differentiated, while one egg did contain a fetus of a crocodile. Should also be noted, they waited until like they knew they weren't going to hatch, so they didn't just be like, oh, eggs, let's open them. But what's strange is the process kind of happening at all. Because this is like in an isolated place away from others of their own kind, it may be that a female got isolated in the area of Maine when the waters receded. Undergoing parthenogenesis, they would then lay eggs that would become the next successive generation. Now the question from here is, as far as we know, just like with pretty much all other animals, nobody is trying to hook up with their sister. Because of this, the crocodiles who were born in the lake together likely look for mates of a different genetic background, but will never find it. And because of this, the males will just sort of hang out and the females will never reproduce until naturally they may undergo parthenogenesis themselves. This may also help to explain why there are also so few crocodiles in the lake. As stated, out of the 14 eggs, only one actually had a fetus in it. From this, we can gather this process is not very efficient, and even then, is a result of some very unique circumstances. As a result, the young that we have seen in the lake at the end may be what's left over from like hundreds of clutches of eggs being laid. This will keep the numbers low as this process is very difficult and the amount of food is limited. What is going to impact this is the old lady feeding the crocodile resulting them rapidly growing to the size that they are genetically predispositioned to, whereas if we left them to their own devices, they would likely remain much smaller given that the food in the lake is limited. But it's also kind of interesting to discuss how exactly did they survive? Because we know 65 million years ago, the giant asteroid that hit uh, the Yucatan Peninsula obviously may have caused some problems like it did for every other animal on the planet. But being that crocodiles have existed, they existed through that event already, and being that Maine was relatively far away from the Yucatan Peninsula and they were in a lake, they may have been relatively shielded from the effects and they may have just entered sort of like what they do already when it's freezing cold outside, a form of hibernation we'll call it and given that their metabolisms are already slow this allowed potentially for the food in the area to rebound while they were still able to survive but anyhow i want to hear what you guys think do you think the species was just dropped off here in the 1800s or do you believe it was an event that happened way back in the day and due to human encroachment we are just kind of learning about it let me know down in the comments i'll drop my twitter discord patreon and roanoke tales channel link where last week we talked about a guy who went on a hike and then for like 15 months he just disappeared and when he showed back up he had no recollection of what he had been doing for those 15 months. Very strange. But speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, huge thank you to our astronaut, Rom Burgundy. Thank you, bro. Next, I'd like to thank our astrophysicist, Death Dancer, as well as our scientist, Chad the Enjoyer of Scientific Explanations of B-Grid Horror Movies, Dakota 23, Lax, Lucian Dragon, Metric System, and Trash Panda in Trench Coat. And to the rest of my patrons, I appreciate you guys as well. Your help goes a long way towards keeping this channel running and is greatly appreciated. All right, so that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and I'll see y'all in the next one.